Uh, thank you again for inviting me here today. Um, I'm talking about, as Andrew said, SF3B1 mutation in CLL. SF3B1 is a splicing factor that is recurrently mutated in various cancers, including CLL, of course. It is one of the most frequently mutated genes in CLL and is associated with poor patient prognosis. So as you expect, um, it is actually quite well studied with short reads. Many groups have found that there is a disproportionate increase in aberrant 3' prime splicing um, in patients with SF3B1 mutation compared to wild-type SF3B1. This particular analysis comes from 37 CLL patients from Kathy Wu's group, and we collaborated with their group to resequence some of these patients with nanopore sequencing. The rationale being that with short read sequencing, looking at these aberrant 3' prime splicing events, you're only able to do it in, in isolation. Whereas with nanopore sequencing, you get a view of the full transcriptional context of these aberrant splicing events. And you can begin to better predict the functional consequences of these aberrant splicing events. So we sequenced um, normal B cells from three healthy donors, B cells being the normal lineage cellular complement to CLL, three CLL patients with wild-type SF3B1, and three with the K700E mutation in SF3B1. Again, we obtained the RNA from Kathy Wu's group. Um, I did an RT, prepared 1D libraries, and we sequenced on the Prometheon. From this, we obtained 149 million reads, which we ran through the FLARE pipeline. Um, these are past reads. Uh, briefly, um, the FLIR pipeline will correct and validate the splice junctions in the reads. And for this step, we also give um, the short read sequences that we already had for these patients. Um, and then FLIR will build a set of transcript isoforms that are representative of the reads. And what we've been working on now is developing these downstream analyses pipelines, um, namely looking at the productivity, uh, differential splicing analyses, and differential isoform usage. And today I'll just be talking about two of those. Um, so first, we, we built all of our isoforms with flare, and we noticed that um, alternative splicing patterns can be very complex. For one, we're looking at cancer samples, and then on top of that, there's the splicing factor mutation. And uh, we noticed that when we ran some short read alternative splicing callers on our data, and here's just an example gene, um, often it would miss or miscall um, some of the splicing events that we expected it to be calling properly. So we wrote our own caller. It's called Flare Diff Splice, and it calls the four main types of alternative splicing events. Um, it'll identify the splicing event. It'll identify which isoforms support the inclusion of the event, which isoforms support the exclusion of the event and equipped with the quantification of each isoform in each of our patients, we can then perform statistical tests to figure out which splicing events are differentially used, significantly differentially used between our two patient groups. So first, of course, we looked at alternative three prime splicing, and um, indeed, we did see an increased amount of alternative three prime splicing in the mutant, and we were able to recapitulate another characteristic of mutant SF3B1, um, and that is this red distribution. Um, it's a length distribution, the length from the cryptic 3' splice site to the canonical 3' splice site. And with Illumina data, it was found that um, SF3B1 mutant, um, the cryptic splice sites tended to be about 20 base pairs upstream of the canonical 3' splice sites. This is in comparison with the blue distribution, uh, which is all of the annotated three prime splice sites and the distance to the closest cryptic splice site as determined by genomic sequence. And so with a different sequencing technology, with a different collar, we were able to recapitulate this pattern. Um, next, we wanted to look at retained introns. As retained introns are difficult to observe confidently with short reads. Here is just an example of MISO, which is a popular short read. Um, alternative splicing caller, miscalling this region as having an intron retention. Because when your fragments are less than the size of your intron, you need to rely on multiple fragments to figure out whether or not there is an intron retention there. Um, with nanopore sequencing, it is much more obvious. 
um, whether or not there's an internal attention in a read. You can even look at coordinated um, alternative splicing. And you can better quantify the extent of intron retention between, your two, between our two sample groups. So when we looked at intron retentions, uh, so, so let me back up, sorry. We split up all of our isoforms as either um, those that were fully spliced or those that contained an intron retention. And we found that for the group of isoforms that contained an intron retention, these isoforms were expressed less in our mutant patients compared to our wild-type SF3B1 patients, meaning that globally, introns are excised more frequently in patients with mutant SF3B1. When we went back and reanalyzed the short read data from two high-profile studies that looked at SF3B1 mutation, we found the same pattern of decreased intron retention in SF3B1 mutant patients or samples, um, although they didn't mention this finding in their manuscripts. And so to us, this was a previously underappreciated finding that we could really only begin to appreciate with nanopore sequencing. Next, we focused on the specific intron retention events that were identified as significantly differentially um, used between our two groups. And um, I want to bring your focus to the second group, which is um, the intron retention events that were more downregulated in SF3B1 compared to the group on the left, which is the intron retention events that were more upregulated by SF3B1. And the y-axis is the magnitude or the degree of the difference in intron retention between mutant and wild type. And so we found that there is a subset of intron retention events that are much more strongly downregulated by SF3B1. When we looked at the events in the second category that we were interested in, we found that none of them overlapped with our short read data. Um, and we think that these two plots might explain why. So the x-axis is the log two of the length of the retained intron that was called as differentially used between our two groups. The y-axis is um, the number of events that fall within that length bin. And you'll notice that essentially any intron retention events that are larger than about 1 kb in the nanopore data weren't, um, weren't being identified. And this makes sense when you consider the fact that our mean and median read lengths for our nanopore data um, were less than 1 kb. And so, you know, the minority of reads are going to be long enough to actually bridge these very long introns in the nanopore data, giving us less statistical power to call um, significant events in that group. Uh, so um, I should say that uh, despite this, we still wanted to pursue our study of the intron retention events that we could identify with nanopore data. And we folded in um, productivity analyses. So uh, with nanopore sequencing, isoform productivity can be more confidently assessed. Um, the definition of a productive isoform is just one that does not have a premature stop codon. So that means its stop codon can be in the last exon or 55 nucleotides from the last exon. And we further distinguish productive and unproductive isoforms by their fate, um, which I'll describe here. So um, for example, here's an example of how we're using this premature stop codon rule to determine productivity. I've highlighted two flare isoforms that were called as unproductive because they had a premature stop codon. They matched two previously characterized isoforms. And these two isoforms were found to be unproductive. Um, um, and I'll explain why. So the first one is unproductive, as you'll notice, um, it's not present in the cytoplasmic fraction of RNA, but it is present in the nuclear. So it's detained to the nucleus. And the second one. Um, when you inhibit NMD with cyclohexamide, the abundance of it increases, meaning that it is typically subject to NMD or it's being degraded. So, these, um, so using this uh, premature stop codon rule to try and predict whether this isoform is um, unproductive, that is, if it's being degraded or detained in the nucleus, um, seems to be like a good proxy. And so we categorized all of our flare isoforms now by their productivity. 
and we found a decrease in the expression of unproductive retained intron isoforms in our mutant sample, uh, mutant patients. Um, a GO term analysis of the genes represented by this group uh, revealed an enrichment of kinase signaling genes. And so the downregulation of unproductive genes that are related to kinase signaling in the mutant uh, may indicate sort of a relative increase in kinase signaling in the mutant compared to wild type. And we think, or we postulate, that this might be um, a model for which SF3B1 mutant can proliferate more quickly. Uh, that's it. Oh, summary. So, um, in summary, with nanopore, we could study uh, differential isoform usage, which I didn't show today, coordinated splicing events, which I also didn't show, but I meant to write differential alternative splicing, um, and isoform productivity. Uh, we used FLARE, and FLARE does use short reads to help with the splice junction validation. And um, our final results were we were able to identify alternative three prime splicing, a downregulation of retained introns, and a shift in expression of unproductive retained intron isoforms. Future work includes doing native RNA sequencing to look at RNA modifications and um, doing a more rigorous coordinated splicing analysis. And so with that, I'd just like to thank my lab, especially my PI, Angela Brooks, um, the Nanopore group, of course, and our collaborators at Dana-Farber. Thanks. <laughs>